Hello and welcome or welcome back to International Yankee English. We post new videos every Monday, Motivation Monday, for your advanced and native English learning purposes. Today we are going to honor International Women's Day by looking at five different women writers. I will read either a short extract from a story from each writer or a short poem from each writer, and we will choose one vocabulary word to look at for each writer as well. If that sounds good to you, give this video a thumbs up and keep watching. First up, we have Carol Ann Duffy from the UK. She was Britain's first poet laureate and the first open LGBT winner in 2009. She has been quoted as saying, Poetry, above all, is a series of intense moments. Its power is not in narrative. I'm not dealing with facts. I'm dealing with emotion. Our first vocabulary word is a B2-level word, blush. That means to become pink in the face, usually from embarrassment. This is a short poem written by Carol Ann Duffy when she was just 11 years old for her teacher. It is untitled. You sat on your desk, swinging your legs, reading a poem by Yeats to the bored girls. Except my heart stumbled and blushed as it fell in love with the words and I saw the tree in the scratched old desk under my hands, heard the bird in the oak outside scribble itself on the air. Did you understand the meaning of the word blushed in this context? Let me know in the comments below and feel free to write your own sentence using this word as well. Next up is Helen Dunmore, who lived from 1952 to 2017. She wrote 12 novels, three books of short stories, numerous books for young adults and children, as well as 11 collections of poetry. She was truly amazing and had a well-respected career. The next vocabulary word is malarkey, from Dunmore's poem, The Malarkey. It means silly behavior or nonsense and is one of President Biden's favorite words. Why did you tell them to be quiet and sit up straight until you came back? The malarkey would have led you to them. You go from one parked car to another and peer through the misted windows before checking the registration. Your pocket bulges. You've bought them sweets, but the mist is on the inside of the windows. How many children are breathing? The malarkey's over in the back of the car. The day is over outside the windows. No streetlight has come on. You fed them cockles soused in vinegar. You took them on the machines. You looked away just once. You looked away just once as you leaned on the chip shop counter and 40 years were gone. You have been telling them forever, stop that malarkey in the back there. Now they have gone and done it. Is that mist or water with breath in it? Our next woman author is Ruth Parr Jabvala. Excuse my mispronunciation. She was born in 1927 and died in 2013. She's a very multicultural, talented writer, and I will be reading a short extract from The Teacher, which was published in The New Yorker in 2008. Our vocabulary word here is underhanded, which means done secretly and sometimes dishonestly with bad intent. I put the list in an envelope with a note to say that I hoped it would be useful to him. I knocked on his door and, receiving no answer, pushed it open. The cottage was empty, not only of him but of any presence whatsoever. There was nothing except my abandoned furniture and the fan I had given him. No photographs, no pictures, nothing personal. I put the envelope on the table and left quickly as though I were doing something underhanded. My instinct turned out to be correct. The next day, Betty came to see me, looking grave and holding the list in her hand. Where's Maeve? I asked, for it was unusual for one to come without the other. Betty smiled at me, though sadly. Maeve is as grateful to you as I am for the list, but she's hurt. She so loves to do things for him. 
Sometimes at night she makes me drive her here just so she can leave a little gift for him. I said, and now she's hurt because the gift of the list was mine and not hers? Poor Maeve, her heart's too full of love. She's an orphan, you know. She was found on the steps of one of the Sister Mary Jo homes. She has no idea who left her there. And, after the orphanage, foster homes. I won't tell you about those, why you should hear such things. Maeve has these strong feelings. Maybe they're wrong. Probably they are. What she's always loved best is to leave anonymous gifts for him. It was the sweetest thought for her that he wouldn't know that you were helping him with the manuscripts. But now he does know. He's seen your list, so he knows we're looking for subscribers. She appeared to accept my apology, but from that time on, something changed between me and the girls. This was true principally of Maeve, who seemed no longer quite to trust me. Or was it that she didn't trust me with him? It was that same day that I entered into a new relationship with Dr. Chaco. For the first time, he came to the porch where I sat with my evening drink. When I invited him to join me, he did so at once. He settled into a chair, and when I offered him a lemonade, he indicated my silver cocktail shaker. I told him what was in it, and he said he'd have that. It was quite a potent martini, but it seemed nothing new to him. After taking a sip, he thanked me for the list I had compiled. Our next author is Anita Desai, born in 1937 in India. we be reading a short extract from In Custody. This is one of the books on the syllabus for the O-Levels or IGCSE Literature and English Cambridge exam. Our vocabulary word for this text is divulge, which means to make something secret known. Uh, reading this extract for um, this piece in custody. I would like to mention that I found this on Scribed. I used to be a paying monthly uh, subscriber. It is $9.99 in euros per month and you can cancel it at any time. They do offer free trials. Um, and while I do not feel the need to have the monthly subscription anymore, I do highly recommend it to students. This is not in any way affiliated or sponsored by Scribed, though if anybody from the company is listening, I would love to work with you. Uh, it is a great service where you can find many hard to find texts or uh, texts that are normally expensive to access uh, for a low monthly cost. Uh, so we will read a short uh, portion of chapter one. His first feeling on turning around at the tap on his shoulder while he was buying cigarettes at the college canteen and seeing his old friend Murad was one of joy so that he gasped, Murad, you? And the cigarettes fell from his hand in amazement. But this rapidly turned to anxiety when Murad gave a laugh, showing his betel-stained teeth beneath the small bristling mustache he wore on his upper lip. But I have a class just now, Murad, he stammered, as Murad squeezed his shoulders tightly as he, if he did not intend to let go. Stop worrying about your class, Murad said, drawing him close and laughing into his ear. I've come all the way from Delhi to see you. Can't you give me half an hour of your time? But it's Monday, not on Monday, Murad. Oh, so friendship is only for Sunday, is it? Is that friendship? Murad boomed. They walked away from the canteen, across the dusty field that separated the corrugated iron shack of the canteen from the brick building of the college where Devon taught. Devon was aware that many of his students had observed this encounter with his old friend and were staring openly, some even smirking at the sight. He tried to wriggle out of Murad's grasp un unobtrusively so as not to offend him. Just one more class, Murad, he pleaded. Then I'm free to go home. Home? Who wants to go home? shouted Murad. We're going to lunch. We're going to lunch in the best restaurant in your great city. If I come all the way to Delhi to see you, then you can at least give me a good lunch, he added in a petulant voice. Of course, of course, Devin assured him. Assured him, I 
just want to note that there are several language errors in this version of this PDF. I apologize for that. And I will continue reading. Feeling guilty at his last lapse in hospitality? Here, have a cigarette. I bought two. He fumbled in his shirt pocket for them, and he handed one to his friend. Still a two-cigarette man, are you? Murad laughed, holding one cigarette between his fingers and waiting for Devon to strike a match. As there was a March wind tearing across the open fields and whirling dust and dry leaves around violently, this was a lengthy, fumbled business. When it was done at last and they strolled on, Murad said insolently, a full-fledged lecturer in a college, an important citizen of Mirpur, and still can't afford a whole packet of cigarettes. You seem to be where you were in your college days. What's the matter? No, no, Devon hastened to explain. My wife has told me not to buy a packet at a time. She says if I go have to go out to buy just one at a time, and I will smoke less. He tried to laugh, as at a pleasant joke. Women are always trying to make you smoke less, drink less, you know. Oh, so you do still drink, do you? I'm glad to hear that. Merod gave a yelp and another clap on Devon's shoulder. Will I get a drink with my lunch? Devon was shocked. He looked furtively over to his left and right. They were walking up the stairs to the main hall. Anyone could have heard, even someone on the staff or the principal himself. His eyebrows crept together in a furry scowl. Please, Murad, leave me now, he muttered anxiously, hunching his shoulders and clutching his books to his chest. I must go to class. Even a visit from an old friend you have not seen for years will not make you give up on your damned class, Murad shouted, pretending to be outraged. Perhaps I should have not come. Why did I bother to catch a bus and travel all the way in this heat to see an old friend who doesn't even care? Devon felt uneasy, certain that Murad had reasons for this that he had not yet divulged. Determined not to go another step with Murad at his side, he stood at the top of the stairs and begged, Please, Murad, wait in the canteen for me. Have a cup of tea there. I'll join you after my class. Then he swung away with such desperation that he dashed right into a group of girl students, also coming up the stairs, and caused much offense affront tittering and giggling which Murad stood and watched with a grin. Next up we have Edith Wharton who was born in 1652 and died in 1937. She was a very well-known writer born in New York and she's definitely one of America's leading novelists and short story writers. The vocabulary word for this text is hyperbole a way of speaking or writing that makes someone or something sound bigger, better, more, etc. than they are. Here is an extract from the short story The Moving Finger. It was Clayton, the portrait painter, who risked this hyperbole and who soon afterward, at the happy husband's request, prepared to defend it in a portrait of Miss Grancy. We were all, even Clayton, ready to concede that Mrs. Grancy's unwontedness was in some degree a matter of environment. Her graces were complimentary, and it needed the mate's call to reveal the flash of color beneath her neutral tinted wings. But if she needed Grancy to interpret her, how much greater was the service she rendered him? Clayton professionally described her as the right frame for him. But if she defined, she also enlarged. If she threw the whole into perspective, she also cleared new ground, opened fresh vistas, reclaimed whole areas of activity that had run to waste under the harsh hus husbandry of privation. This interaction of sympathies was not without its visible expression. Clayton was not alone in maintaining that Grancy's presence, or indeed the mere mention of his name, had a perceptible effect on his wife's appearance. It was as though a light were shifted, a curtain drawn back, as though, to borrow another of Clayton's metaphors, love. The indefatigable artist were his model. In this interpretive light, Mrs. Grancy acquired the charm which makes some woman's faces look like a book of which the last page is never turned. There was always something new to read in her eyes. What Clayton read there 
or at least such scattered hints of the ritual as reached him through the sanctuary doors, his portrait in due course declared to us. When the picture was exhibited, it was at once acclaimed as his masterpiece, but the people who knew Mrs. Grancy smiled and said it was flattered. Clayton, however, had not set out to paint their Mrs. Grancy, or ours even, but Ralph's, and Ralph knew his own at a glance. At the first confrontation, he saw that Clayton had understood. As for Miss Grancy, when the finished picture was shown to her, she turned to the painter and she said simply, Ah, you've done me facing the East. Well, that's it for today, guys. I hope you liked this video. If you found it valuable, please give it a thumbs up. If you are an English teacher, feel free to use this material for an International Women's Day lesson plan. And feel free to join our Facebook support group to follow me on Clubhouse and Instagram, as well as LinkedIn for future teacher and learner tips. And please come back on Thursday. I will be doing a live stream lesson at 5 p.m. this coming Thursday. That is March 4th. And that will be at 5 p.m. Central European or Amsterdam local time. And you can check your time zone conversion at timeanddate.com. We also have a weekly conversation practice on Zoom. And that will be at 3 p.m. Central European time. Just go ahead and hit the subscribe button on YouTube before joining our Facebook learning group. And then you can find all of the login details. The practice lessons are completely free and you can join us on Tuesdays for that in our monthly conversation class led by me for select users so active members of our community may join that will be this coming Sunday March 7th at 3 p.m. Central European Amsterdam local time and if you join our group you will see a calendar of events for even more learning opportunities and be sure to follow me on Clubhouse so you can join some of my learning rooms or the rooms where I am a co-host or moderator. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you at the next video. Bye.